I'm Doug Sears, and I'm president of the Tewksbury Historical Society. And it's nice to see so many faces here of folks that uh, have an interest over a long period of time in history. And we are an older crowd, and we understand what history is, I would say, more uh, thoroughly as we go throughout our day to day. And what we would like to is the Tewksbury Historical Society is, is to in, encourage you know, the love of history that uh, the folks here all share uh, to younger folks. And we hope that uh, they will find in their own way interest in the town they live in. As, uh, as uh, our late member uh, Gene Winter showed, that uh, over where they're over behind uh, um, the post office there, that people had been uh, having cooking fires there for f over 5,000 years from what he had carbon dated. Uh, and that is where I think we're planning to have a MBTA uh, slash you know, community uh, at some point point in time as a designated spot. So it's important to know that we are uh, part of a long line of inhabitants of this community and that uh, various folks here have interests. And what I try to do, what Nancy and the whole directors try to do, is to get people interested sort of through the society and then people go out and f pursue their their own particular passions, and you know, in history, and that uh, is uh, something that we hope we're able to en encourage today. Uh, we have two uh, speakers, both doing very local things in Tewksbury. Uh, Charlie McDermott is a good friend, uh, and he has uh, gone metal detecting for a long period of time. Uh, he has fought poison ivy, uh, he's fought, fought ticks, he's fought brambles, and uh, as uh, uh, sort of the Indiana Jones of some of our local patches and beyond, and uh, he has brought with us just a small sampling of uh, items that he has uh, collected over the course of time, and I'm looking forward very much to understanding how he does it and what he can find and, and what is evocative from you know, the past that can be brought up in this way to our present. Now, Bob Baden is a uh, avid horticulturalist and he is going to speak the second speaker up at Tewksbury Hospital. And as I was having an early foreshortened conversation uh, earlier to this afternoon, uh, when I was on the board of the Tewksbury Hospital, one of the things Ray Sanzone, who was the director at the time, uh, encouraged was fixing up some of the interesting facilities up there. And we put some money, we had a foundation, the Tewksbury Hospital Trustees Endowment Fund, and we put it toward fixing up the greenhouses there. Well, that didn't last, you know, forever, and so we're very fortunate that 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 Bob uh, has been able to find the, the resources, find the people power, and find the appropriate plants to make it not only bring the greenhouses back, uh, but to make them an educational tool again to get other people interested in doing these things. So. We will have uh, Charlie speak first for a while, and then we will we will break and uh, have more goodies and coffee and, and cider, which the members here have provided. Thank you all. And uh, without further ado, Charlie. Victor. It's all yours. Good afternoon. I'm Charlie McDermott, and I grew up in uh, Tewksbury in the 50s and 60s, right up on Livingston Street. 
Uh, those were the good old days. They are long gone now. But uh, I remember Kendall Road, the whole length of Kendall Road from North Street all the way down into Andover. There were six houses. Six houses. Four of them were probably built probably around the 1850s. And uh, now there's probably a thousand houses. I don't know how many developments. And uh, well, you can see how the traffic is today. <laughs> it's uh, used to be the carnation capital. Now it's the condo capital. And uh, now things were just so great back back growing up in the 50s and 60s. Uh, you could walk all the way down Livingston Street and maybe see three cars, you know. Uh, but I've, over the years, I've got interested in metal detecting and I've detected over at the state hospital probably for seven years. Um, plus I detect other towns too, Chelmsford, Westford, Carlisle, and uh, it's a great hobby. It keeps you going, keeps you in shape, and uh, I really enjoy it. Um, I, I have brought a few items with me today to, to show you. Um, I have found some beautiful coins over the years. Uh, coins, coins from uh, King George II, 1749-1750s. Uh, a lot of uh, old silver from the uh, 1850s, and uh, I've got uh, oxen shoes, I've got horseshoes, I've got uh, uh, all kinds of things that I found. I'll show you a few of them here. Hang on. Now these here are your oxen shoes. They used to put these on the oxen. They had the split toe of the oxen, not like a horse, where they had the one shoe. Uh, but I find quite a few of these. I probably have about 50 pounds of them at the house. Now this oxen shoe and this hot shoe, uh, horseshoe here, I, uh, I use uh, electrolysis on them to take all the rust off and clean them up and I sprayed them with a, a clear lacquer coat so keep them from rusting. Now this must have been a big boy right here. <laughs> <laughs> this here is uh, I found down by the Merrimack River. It's a radiator cap to a 1927 Pontiac Roadster. <laughs> And here's your assortment of skeleton keys that I've found in a lot of fields, a lot of them right in the, right in the state hospital fields, and a lot of these brass clips that uh, I found out there. And we got the old cap gun from the 50s. <laughs> I think this here used to screw in to the old wooden oak barrels back in the day. <laughs> I, think I, I think I was watching a, a video and I finally found out what it was. They used to screw these into the old oak barrels, which is pretty cool. Now these guys here, they used to uh, go on what they called uh, the hoss hames on a hoss. The old work horses used to have a big leather thing around their neck 
and then they had these two stanchions coming up on either side of uh, of that big leather thing that the workhorse had. And these would go on top of those stanchions, and they're more of a decorative thing, I believe. But I found probably a half a dozen of these out in the fields. I shined these ones up, you know, but a nice pure brass. Yeah, the uh, little round bells, uh, the crotal bells, they call them. They used to put on the uh, animals to keep the uh, predators away. That's what I heard anyways. Um, and we have these other things over here. It took me a while to find out what they were. These, they're like caps, brass caps, and these would screw on to the, uh, either the oxen or the cow's um, horns. So I guess they couldn't, um, uh, when they, if they came after you or whatever, you wouldn't get stuck. Um, or if they were, it wouldn't gore any of the other animals. So I thought that was interesting. And here's what your grandmother used to make a big pot of gruel with, right here, stirring it up. <laughs> yeah, I got, um, uh, you know, I brought some musket balls with me. I, I only brought a a pound or two. I probably got 10 pounds of musket balls. Um, I've got some colonial buttons here. You're welcome to look at this stuff. Um, and, uh, and you can look at the coins, you know, the, some of them beautiful coins that I found. I only bought, brought a small part of my collection. I wanted, wanted it to be nice and orderly when I brought it, but um, as you can see, it's just a mishmash. Um, I didn't really have a great container to put them in, so I, I used an old picture frame. <coughs> Excuse me. But it, it wasn't holding the coins tight enough, so they're just moving all over the place. But um, what else we got here? Yeah, I got some cool locks here that I that I found. I think some of them might be. I think this might be a railroad lock. This one here, I think I found at Haggett's Pond. It, it's called a hot lock. I think it has a date on the back of it, like 1882 or something. But these are cool finds. The old locks. Does anyone in here detect? That is your contraption work that Charlie You don't want to settle detecting. Oh. Oh, this is. I forgot all about this guy. Oh. <laughs> Excuse me, I got a dry throat. But um, Thomas E. Bickford, he was a. Uh, he was a soldier in, a, in the Civil War, and I found his um, ID uh, disc in the state hospital field. And he got killed in Virginia in uh, 1864. <laughs> and uh, on this, on one side of it is an eagle and it says the Great War of 1861. And uh, on the other side, it says T.E. Bickford, Company E, 11th Regiment, Volunteer, Epsom, New Hampshire. I tried doing some genealogy, trying to uh, 
locate some of his family. But uh, that's pretty tedious. I'd have to have a professional do that, I think. Or I could go up to the cemetery up there in, uh, up there in New Hampshire. <coughs> and I might be able to get the latest name off of one of the uh, gravestones or whatever and track it that way. I'm not sure. <coughs> Seriously? How do you think that little medallion wound up the... You know what? Because I think it was a train station mm -hmm. on the back end of that cornfield. Yeah, From just what I found on the ground, this electrical wires, mm -hmm. there's a lot of... Uh, mm -hmm. uh, actually, it's pretty... They had some pretty glass back then. Um, that was broken. Um, the old light sockets, the old... Uh, uh, they used to call it the um, northern tube, mm -hmm. that type of wiring. So I think he could, I think the train stopped. Well, they must have had a station or something there. The train stopped, and he must have got off the train for whatever reason. He lost his head. Um, he probably had himself. That's about it, but um, yeah, it's a great hobby. It keeps me going. I probably could you just show your, your equipment and how it works? Detector. Yeah, on my next hour. Oh, okay. <laughs> 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 yeah, sure. Uh. <laughs> it's pretty, it's pretty, but you know what. They got so many different ones out there. You buy one, you gotta learn. You gotta learn. You gotta. You can watch YouTube videos on it. Uh, this one's pretty simple. <coughs> I just set it up, set it, and forget it. You know, all I do now is just turn it on. Um, 
Je bent snijf zilver, je hebt een haarje van. Je hebt het zijn nekkel of something, it will be like a mid-tone. En je eind will give you kind of like a grunt type of noise. Ja. Ik wil graag zo'n microfoon op te zeggen, en dan ik naar Oh, oké. Sorry. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Uh, what was your most significant find? Uh, finding that gentleman's uh, ID tag, and I found a um, uh, a uh, 1788 Massachusetts state copper coin. Uh, it, it has uh, an eagle on the front of it, and then on the on the back of it, it has. Uh, an Indian with a bow, and uh, yeah, that that was a, a great find because they only made them two years, 1787 and 1788. So uh, that was a significant find. I'd like to find the uh, pine tree shilling, and I could retire. <laughs> but um, well, thank you very very much. Hey, Bob Baden has been waiting patiently out and uh, will share with us how he's come to this uh, specific position at the Tewksbury Hospital, how he's kind of found a love and then made around him uh, a uh, educational uh, career and that uh, this being a, everyone here being familiar with the hospital, probably everybody knows where the, the greenhouses are and how they have needed to be rehabbed and uh, to made the way they were supposed to be and then approve upon that. So Bob, why don't you take it away? my notes down today so that I wouldn't ramble on incessantly. <laughs> Any of you that know me know that is a danger we may face regardless. Uh, so let us, I want to first thank everyone for inviting me uh, to come here and talk about my favorite topic which is the GROW program and the hospitals that are up at Tewksbury State, I mean the greenhouses that are up at Tewksbury State Hospital. My name is Bob Baden and I proudly work for the Justice Resource Institute which is a leader in social justice and, under and serving the underserved communities. I am the founder of the Gardening Resources of Wellness program or GROW. And since 2019, I have also been the lucky steward of the old greenhouses up on the hill. Those bad boys. Now referred to as the Grow Greenhouses. I would like to start today by letting you know that in the last year alone, the Grow, grow Greenhouses have grown and delivered 1,500 plants to the Tewksbury Garden Club plant sale. We have grown and delivered 1,500 plants to the Power of Flowers fundraiser, The Bloom. The Grow Greenhouses hosted The Bloom for the third consecutive year this year. We have grown and planted several thousand additional plants for the Tewksbury Hospital campus. We've continued our commitment working with community initiatives in Tewksbury, and we've continued our commitment working weekly with residents of the Tewksbury Hospital community, both inside Justice Resource Institute programs and outside. We have participated in the Art Bloom here in Tewksbury, but most importantly, we have continued to provide and expand our therapeutically informed groups on a weekly basis. We did all of this in the last six months. I am sure many of you have a, a mental image of what the greenhouses have at times looked like. So the question before us is, how did the last four of Tewksbury Hospital's greenhouses, languishing for decades, go from being an insurance liability to a thriving wellness center. 
in the summer of 2019, I was visiting one of the JRI programs at Tewksbury Hospital. And when I left for home, I left by the back, back exit, where I found, crumbling their way down Greenhouse Road, the last of Tewksbury Hospital's greenhouses, perched on a hill for everyone to see, a chapter of Tewksbury's hospital history was slumped, but still standing. Punished by time and neglect for being too big a project to resurrect, and too big a project, frankly, to dismantle. The largest of the greenhouses had an 80-foot long polyethylene roof that had been flapping back and forth in the breeze for decades. Here you see video of it the day I found the greenhouse, well, didn't find them. You can see that it had been flapping up and down Greenhouse Road forever. Even though the original structures were giving in to mother's, Mother Nature's demands, they were still holding firm and waiting to be resurrected. Even though the built-in beds were cracked, they still held the original soil that had been there for about 40 years. Someone came in and looked at it and said it looked about 40 years old, given what was in it. This house had burned, and trees and plants had grown up through the structure, through not only this house, but two others. Oh, I want to go back. This house, standing 30 feet tall, we refer to as the atrium. It was a tangle of 14 to 18 foot long tomato vines, white fly infestation, and a red fox that had been calling at home for quite some time. <laughs> there was no hot water. There was no bathroom. We had feral cats, floods, and a constant parade of the unwell raccoon to contend with. <laughs> and, uh, and I was smitten. Uh, when I asked for and was given a tour, I thought it was funny that the director actually used a key to open the door that we simply could have walked around. <laughs> Tuxbury. I was shocked. I was shocked that these buildings, recognized as historic landmarks in 1920, had been unable to regain their intended purpose. Now, aside from the overwhelming cost to repair, re-roof, heat, rewire, plumb, staff, and maintain four large, moody little greenhouses, I couldn't think of one reason they'd been ignored for so long. My problem is that I oftentimes see the light, but never the forest in front of it. As I say, I was smitten. I could see the potential for something here. My dream, a multi-tiered therapeutic horticulture center, educational, and vocational opportunities for children, teens, and adults all in recovery. It could be a destination. Additionally, this destination seemed to embody much of what those surrounding it were going through themselves. A repurposing, a refortification, and a re-understanding of themselves and who they are. More 4-H than 4-star, the, the GROW program, could unify those who live in isolation at the hospital. We could take people out of clinical settings, hospital rooms, televisions, and phone screens, and put them into a community of gardeners. By providing a less obvious treatment-based approach to wellness, we could subversively, if you will, augment an existing treatment plan by introducing the benefits of working with plants. My friend and current supervisor, Candy Foley, a long-established program director at Justice Resource Institute, arranged for me to pitch my idea to the powers that be, and they agreed. We discussed the potential, and I was given a very modest budget with which to undertake the project, which begs the question, how do you rebuild four greenhouses? There are 12 businesses in Massachusetts that do this kind of work. Every single one of them turned me down. Each one of them either had been to the greenhouses and declined on the project or were simply afraid of dealing with the greenhouses <laughs> for whatever the reason. Enter Bill Orlando and Orlando Greenhouse. Bill actually agreed to meet with me and he pointed out every single thing in the building that needed to be fixed. I told him about my upbringing in the White Mountains and my love of gardening, and he continued pointing out every single thing in the buildings that needed to be fixed. 
I explained to him that the garden was my best friend when I crawled out of the bottle 30 years ago, and he continued to tell me about all the things that needed to be fixed. It was clear that I could not afford whatever this was going to add up to. So I walked Bill out to his truck, and he talked at me for about another 30 minutes. If you know Bill, he is a very big personality. And when the gentleman speaks, shut up and listen. For the first time in my life, I shut up and I listened. And then, to my astonishment, Bill graciously agreed to repair two of the houses for my modest budget. I would have to compromise. He would squeeze the project in somewhere. I would get a 24-hour notice, full stop. Well, this was November 19th of 2019, and winter was already knocking on the door, and I wasn't really sure what squeeze the project in meant. But while I was waiting for Bill's call, JRI allowed me to purchase some seed carts and seeds and some basic materials that I would need to get us started. And then, that's right. <laughs> and then a month later, as promised, the call came, and within two weeks, Bill had built us not two, but three greenhouses for the budget of two. We paid 10 cents on the dollar, 10 cents on the dollar for what this would have cost. When people ask me what it costs to renovate these, and they ask if I did it for under half a million, and I tell them what we spent, they're Jaws are on the floor. Bill Orlando was the first, maybe second person in the road to yes. He made this possible. I can't reiterate that enough. Um, randomly, during this, I met a member of the Cogswell family who had grown up in the house that sits squarely in the center of these four greenhouses. You can see it right there on the right. The gentleman who I met, his father, Stuart Cogswell, was the greenhouse caretaker in the 1950s. And we were loaned Stuart's handwritten seed notes from 1953 and 1954. Inspired by this, I applied for and was awarded the Terrell Emissions Grant from the Tewksbury Congregational Church. This generous grant funded an initiative called Stuart's Flowers, honoring the history of the greenhouses, Chooksbury Hospital's history, and, the, and Stuart Cogswell himself. We would follow Stuart's notes and replicate what he grew and give the flowers away to the recipients as his notes dictated in 1953 and 1954. So you got flowers delivered to you one day with a card that said your flowers were ordered by Stuart 75 years ago. We wanted to add a joke about sorry it took so long to get them delivered. <laughs> we couldn't find the address on campus, but you know. Uh, I digress. Uh, I reached out at this time and started collaborating with campus entities in, in order to create a volunteer program. The work of getting these greenhouses up and running was far too much for myself to do, so we looked at bringing in other people. Um, I reached out and started collaborating with these entities on campus to create the volunteer program. And once it was established and those volunteer positions were filled, I then focused on vocational opportunities for teen residents living in JRI programs. As a result of this reaching out, the men of the Lowell House Men's Residential Center offered to help restore four raised beds that had been left to sit there for about 60 years. They hadn't been, one of them had been used in the last decade. The rest of them had just been taken over by animals. So they came in and offered to rebuild these raised beds and showcase to younger residents from other residential programs the importance of trade skills. Tewksbury Hospital gave us a little help with some of the bigger toys that we didn't have and helped us get the job done. And so we were breathing life back into this forgotten chapter of Tewksbury, and then COVID. Yeah, with respect to those <laughs> hurt by the pandemic, while the rest of the world stopped in its tracks, I doubled down and ran towards this. 
For the next year, I worked seven days a week getting done what I had lined up a team to accomplish, setting and fixing the outside beds, inside beds, germinating and caring for thousands of seedlings for campus, removing thousands of pounds of junk and steam pipes that had accumulated in and around the greenhouses, not to mention getting rid of the weeds, the bugs, and the mammals that had been calling our greenhouses home for quite some time. It was an endless list of immediate action items. I don't say this to brag. I say it to explain the compulsion I felt then and feel now for the GROW program and for the greenhouses themselves. I say it to amplify my belief that those greenhouses have more history in front of them than behind. As the COVID restrictions eased, I had the opportunity to meet and subsequently invite M. Sherman Foley to the GROW team. M. hit the ground running, working in tandem with the JRI team to develop program activities that would suit each of the varied populations we would serve, all through the lens of therapeutic horticulture. It wasn't long before our volunteers returned and our work with the hospital, oh, I did that again, well, bear with me. It wasn't long before our work with the residents returned and our volunteers returned. The new house, oops, hold on one second, please. That just died out. Let's just cut right down to it. You can practice all you want, kids, but technology, I'm just going to say, it's no good. All right. Those are the res residents had returned, uh, as well as working with some of the kids. These kids are from uh, uh, Center Point Transcend, and I'm allowed to show them because they all sign releases. Otherwise, we don't show you who comes to the program in any way, shape, or form. Um, we realized that we had reached all of our goals, and that left the one remaining greenhouse, which was the new house. Last year, JRI was kind enough. It's going to cut out again, isn't it? Damn it. JRI was kind enough to allow us to have the fourth greenhouse rebuilt. Uh, Re-roofed, new floor, plumbing, electrical, the entire thing. And that is what houses today most of the therapeutic work that we do. Sitting in the middle of all of that is my new obsession, which is the house, the Cogswell residence that I referred to earlier. A renovation there would afford us the opportunity to have clean administrative spaces, clean therapeutic spaces, a bathroom, and multiple other rooms that are desperately needed up there. Unfortunately, I'm going on vacation for two weeks, so I'm going to start that project in July, but maybe someday you'll invite me back and I'll let you know if I get that done. Um, I would like to see that as a part of the green space. I see Tewksbury initiatives there. I see the Garden Club. We've talked about this before and other elements of Tewksbury having a presence in that building. It's part of your history. Um, with that, I had a great picture of some of the shirts that we've done as collaborating with Power of Flowers and a number of other people, but that kind of brings us full circle where we are today with the greenhouses. Uh, we still work with the people that are residents there, growing, seeding, and germinating, and caring for all the plants that are grown on campus. Uh, we are constantly providing flowers and plants to other organizations when asked as much as we can. And of course, as I said, the expansion of our therapeutics this year is really the most important thing, as that's really what we're there for. And with that, I thank you all for taking the time to listen to the greenhouses and about them. And does anyone have any questions? Yes, ma'am. Susan. Um, as a representative of our I would just like to say that we have had an absolutely wonderful collaboration with you, you over many years now Thank because you. you helped us out with our ACE program, which is Action for Community Environment. And what we do is go around town and plant things. So when you leave here today and you see the containers that are outside of the entry, that is... Um, those are um, flowers that were um, grown by Bob at the greenhouses, and we've been able to use those there out at the front at the War Memorial. All those gorgeous geraniums that are out there are all brought at the greenhouses. 
and all of your work and efforts, and you are such an asset to the entire Thank you. community. Thank you. Um, not just the, the hospital, but your work is out here for everyone. Thank you. Women. And we really thank you. Thank you. I appreciate Justice Resource gave me an opportunity to fly with something. They didn't know me from Adam. And they have not questioned one penny of their money that I have spent to date. And I continue to work as hard as I possibly can to ensure that the community, that we're a part of the community, that we're serving JRI, we're serving the hospital. It's, it has been the vision from day one. Nothing has been so clear in my life as that. Thank you. Oh, you have one? Oh, the monarch butterfly. Yeah, so last year we did, uh, I'm sorry, I'll be brief. Uh, last year we released 25 butterflies to the wild uh, in tandem with the Monarch Ranch, which is also here in Tewksbury. We did it as part of a wellness training with JRI employees. Uh, we brought in 25 chrysalis that were pretty much scheduled that they would hatch that morning, which most did. They will sit on your shoulder for hours while they get their bearings. Uh, monarch butterflies, not to steal their shtick, but are born with a GPS. They can fly as high as 15,000 feet in the air, 500 miles a day. They'll go 200 miles out of their way to find milkweed. And they're born with a GPS, so they'll go from here and end up in Mexico on the Day of the Dead. Figure that out. I'm, I can't get anywhere on time. Butterflies are doing it better than I am. And they will fly back if they're actually able. So we did a thing where we released butterflies one day, and it was outrageous. It, it was just one of those therapeutic events that spawned, I think we've done four more as a result of that one. So yeah, stuff like any kind of, uh, of a collaboration like that is, is wonderful. So, Do you maintain the winter time? I'm, I'm so sorry? Do you maintain the temperature in the winter time? Uh, yeah, so the atrium, the tallest of the houses only got heat this year. So I was betting the kids that we worked with that we could grow gardens all which long without heat. Which you can do, so we did. Uh, we cruised out all in Geelong, unheated. The only day we got nailed was last year with that 14 below. Yeah. That was it. I lost two tomato plants inside. Everything else stayed above 50 degrees at night. Uh, now that house uh, has been heated. And so now all four of the, uh, the greenhouses are heated. We do keep them heated all year round. We grow 365. Uh, is there any uh, time that uh that you set aside for so the, the public to you know to to visit up there? Um, I would be happy to do so. Um, the problem we have, which is not a great problem to have, is too much interest. And by that I mean we have therapeutic groups going on. So we have different requirements and laws that you need to adhere to. So when people just like show up, I love hearing the stories, but it's difficult. We are trying to uh, work with the um, Mental Health Museum to sort of get in with their tour and uh, come on in and see them. So that's something that we'd be interested in doing. We'd love to do it in a controlled way. It can be scheduled and done. Absolutely. They're your greenhouses. I mean, I know the state might not be full of state that. <laughs> but they're close to the Well, thank you for everything. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm going to go compost this right now. <laughs> well, thank you again, Bob. This is uh, yet again an example of someone who is creative and who has talent and I guess a bit of salesmanship too. Uh, you can find something that needs to be done uh, and, and run with it. Uh, and I am so pleased that uh, these greenhouses have been rehabilitated, they've been incorporated into various programs and it's still expanding on what it can be. So I want to thank our, both Charlie, uh, Charlie and Bob for our presentations today. Uh, we are at the close of the program. Uh, we want to make sure everyone has uh, registered, or not registered, but just, you know, signed in uh, today. And uh, we look forward to seeing you all at other events sponsored by the Tewksbury Historical Society in the future. So thank you all and good afternoon.